I'm Chiz Cool Gaming, and in this guide, we're going to grow you from 5 to 30 million power. And we're going to pull from our experience of over 1,100 consecutive days played across our three different accounts. And if you're one of the tens of thousands of advanced players already watching our videos every single day, consider dropping a comment on this video with any other advice you have for someone who is growing to 30 million power. If you're new to this channel and you're looking to get strong fast, you found the right video and you're in the right place. Let's get started. In this video, we're going to cover the following topics as we grow you to 30 million power. These include swapping civilizations so that you grow faster, commanders, and what your commander profile should look like by the time you hit 30 million power, city upgrades, certain orders and tricks as you're upgrading your city, as well as things you're going to need. We're going to get a look at farm accounts, which becomes critically important as you grow through the early game. And in addition, research that is crucial on your path to success, including T4.5, VIP upgrades, which are worth, which are not, and last but not least, your first Kingdom versus Kingdom experience. If you like Rise of Kingdoms guides that help you get value and smash your enemies, consider subscribing for daily Rise of Kingdoms videos, and let's start with our first topic. If you saw my last comprehensive beginner's guide, you know that I think most people are overthinking their civilization. We're going to spend only a little bit of time on this now, because as you're going to 30 million power, there are some things you could consider doing with your civilization, and I'm going to advocate that the thing you want to focus on is a civilization that helps you grow toward T5. Now look, We've got a very comprehensive guide that covers civilization swaps, so I'm just going to highlight a few here that I think could be helpful on your journey toward T5. Germany is one of those civilizations, sort of, because it's going to give you the ability to train more troops, which is really powerful, and action point recovery, so you can get a lot of free value battling barbarians on the map. I think it is a solid choice. Another solid choice would be Spain. You're going to need a lot of resources, and Spain is going to help you with your resource production. They're also not really going to help you per se on your way to T5 troops and growing a 30 million power beyond the extra resources, but I do like the extra experience you will gain in leveling up your commanders. This is something that will be good early, but in the late game will lose a lot of its value. Continuing on, I think that China is an interesting idea for a starting civilization, and if you've already chosen it, stick with it until you've done most of your buildings to their max level. I do also really like the action point recovery. I think Japan is a pretty solid choice on your way to T5 for the gathering speed if you are very vigilant about sending out your gatherers constantly. Otherwise, ignore it. And the last one that I want to call your attention to as a reasonable choice on your way to 30 million power and T5 is Korea. Now, Korea, I think, is a trap civilization. I think a lot of people choose this because they want the research speed and they want to get to T5 faster, not realizing that it takes thousands of days worth of speed ups in order to get to T5. Yes, thousands upon thousands of days. So... If you're just slowly working your way toward T5, Korea is not a very good choice because you're losing the opportunity to get tons of value from things like having your action point recovery over time or having your uh, resource production and EXP gain over time. Korea is the sort of civilization that a big spender switches to. They use all their speed ups all at once as they level up a bunch of technology, and then they switch off of it uh, to something that gives them more value over time. So I would not recommend Korea. My top pick is likely going to be Spain. It's balanced as you're going to 20 million power. It gives you the resource production and the commander experience, which I think is particularly value. But if you go to Spain, plan to swap to something else later on, and that will cost you a whole bunch of alliance currency in order to make that change. Let's jump to our next topic, which is very important. Let's go get a look at the commanders and 
what you should expect to have as you make your way toward 30 million power. To do that, we're going to switch over to our restart project where we, in the last 150 days, started anew and went through all the motions of a beginning account so that this advice will be fresh. Okay, here we are on our restart account. This is almost 200 days old at this point. So let me show you what our commanders look like and give you some tips as you're working through the game and where you should be investing. Now, at the legendary tier, we started by expertising Esong, YSG. In my opinion, he is the best legendary in Rise of Kingdoms, and I think it is worth focusing on one commander to get them into a really great place rather than spreading out your investments to have a bunch of mediocre commanders. With that said, I do think that if you're picking a couple other commanders to invest in instead of going this route, that having your Richard I as a 5511 would be really solid, and then you could save up your commander sculptures for another commander like Constantine, who I think is a phenomenal investment, and even on my main account, I have been very happy with Constantine as a 5511. As we make our way over to 30 million power, that's something that I'm going to be considering looking at. Now, I think the more important thing to look at for this style of account on your way to 30 million power, especially if you're not a big spender or spending at all, is the collection of epics. You know that my recommendation is that you start by expertising Boudicca, then Sun Tzu, then Joan of Arc. From there, I think you've got options. I really like going to Kusunoki. I somewhat regret having done Pelagius. I thought I would use him more than I am. I actually found that I got a good bit more value from Ulji Mundok, who I'm using pretty extensively, and I kind of wish that instead of doing Pelagius, I had spent those on a peacekeeper like Belisarius so that I would get some value battling barbarians. Now, in terms of the levels of my commanders, these are actually fairly underleveled compared to where they should be. And this brings us to the next thing I wanted to talk about with commanders, which is leveling them up. It is, in my opinion, a very good idea to at least once, maybe twice a day, go and battle guardians at the holy sites in your kingdom because they give a ton of experience and it costs no action points whatsoever to go and battle them. Free experience and boatloads of it is amazing. If I had been doing that, easily all of these commanders that I'm using as primaries that are not level 60 would be level 60, and that would have gone a very, very long way. I just don't have the time for it. So if you're making that time, your commanders can end up in a really good place. And honestly, I do a remarkable amount of winning in game modes like Lost Canyon and Sunset Canyon, even with these underleveled commanders, because we're setting them up in the right ways. We've got commander guides, so we won't go too in-depth on that here. What I do want to cover is that as you're working your way up to 30 million power, your focus should be on equipment that is gray and green and a little bit of blue equipment. Do not get sucked in to epics and legendaries, which cost you a ton of materials. Those are things that, unless you're the rally leader or garrison captain for a flag, you shouldn't be working on. You're better off getting more of your marches into a good place that you're using in a game mode like Canyon. That'll be helpful for Sunset Canyon, but also for Lost Canyon. And we'll talk about that in just a bit at the KVK portion of this video. Now, something you're going to notice as you're powering up is that you're going to be constrained on the number of stars you have. Those stars are going to be used to take a commander past level 50. Uh, so my recommendation to you for commanders you should put your stars into would be at the legendary tier, Esong or Minamoto, if you spent on Minamoto. If you didn't, then I would focus on Richard, if that's a commander that you're doing. At the epic tier, I would focus on Sun Tzu. I would focus on Joan of Arc. And your peacekeepers, when they naturally hit those thresholds to cross level 50, consider starring them up as well. Um, my guidance to you would be to avoid putting lots of experience tomes into your peacekeepers. The reason I recommend against doing that is that eventually your peacekeepers are all going to be level 60, and it might take a little bit of time, but you'll get there. And after that point, every time you battle a barb on the map, that experience is wasted. So leveling your way up to 20 with experience tomes makes sense. You can bring a secondary commander 
but otherwise I would be very cautious about power leveling your peacekeepers and even using combos like Lohar and Boudicca I think is pretty risky once you get past level 40 because okay you've power leveled your peacekeepers but then you haven't power leveled the other commanders that are far more important including again Sun Tzu, in my opinion, Joan of Arc, and also whichever primary legendary you're working on. In my case, it's Esong. Let's switch gears now and go to our next chapter, which is city upgrades. And we have a lot to talk about here. All right, this topic is super meaty. Upgrading stuff in your city is critically important. And what you'll find on your way to 30 million power is that in the early part of the game, you're going to need speed ups, you're going to have a ton of resources. Then, in this phase of the game, you're going to need resources really badly, and you're going to have more than enough speed ups to kind of do what you need to do. And then in the next part of the game, after 30 million power, you're going to be out of speed ups and really wishing you had more of them, and you're going to have way more than enough resources than you know what to do with. Spoiler alert, you're going to use those for war. So with that said, I want to talk a little bit about what you're working toward in your city. And that key building is going to be both City Hall 25 and then Academy 25. When you get to City Hall 25, you'll have unlocked the full number of marches at that point, the max number of troops contained within a march, which is very powerful, but also the ability to level up all of the other buildings in your city to 25 as well. Of note is going to be the academy. And the reason is that when you take your academy to level 25, not only do you make available to you the highest tiers of research in the game, but also you make available to yourself a solid 7% research speed boost. Whew, that is really, really good. There's just one small problem as you're working your way toward that, which is that this is going to require you to have every other building in your city at 25 already. That's right, my friends. There's a chain of sort of requirements for each of these different buildings, and it is pretty freaking tricky to make your way up to an academy level 25. To do that, you're going to have to make a ton of upgrades. Now, to take any building to 25, it is going to require something called a master's blueprint. That master's blueprint is available to you in the shop, and I know of no way to get this at a discount. It costs you a cool 2,000 gems a pop. So for every building you're taking to 25, you're gonna need 2,000 gems. Now, fear not, you can farm thousands of gems a day on the map if you're vigilant. We've got a guide about that. The link is in the description, which you can check out at the tail end of this video if you're looking for more information. My recommendation to you for this Master's Blueprint, and another thing we're going to talk about spending gems on, is that you buy them during an event called More Than Gems. More Than Gems rewards you for spending your gems and just gives you extra stuff. So if you're not in a rush, wait for that event to buy up a bunch of these. That's what we personally did on this account, and I feel that worked very, very well. A couple other buildings that are going to be pretty tricky to upgrade because they require a special currency include your watchtower. The watchtower is going to require arrows of resistance. My recommendation to you for getting boatloads of arrows of resistance is to wait until the event Lohar's Trial is here. The bone necklaces that drop for that have a high amount of arrows of resistance, and you can even try to time that in conjunction with a Mighty Governor Barbarian Kill event and spend a bunch of action points, both getting points in Mighty Governor and getting arrows of resistance and Lohar's you can summon, which seems really, really solid. That would be my recommendation to you for the Arrows of Resistance. Do not spend gems on these. And quite frankly, in the grand scheme of things, the Watchtower is not all that important of a building. It is going to protect your city a little bit if you get swarmed, but not much against a rally, which is the thing that you are more afraid of anyways. The next building that has a special currency we need to talk about is the castle. Again, all of these buildings required on your way to Academy 25. The castle is going to require Books of the Covenant, which come primarily from rallying forts, and that takes a very, very, very long time and a huge amount of dedication. Many people end up spending gems on these, myself included, and if you are spending gems on these, do it during a More Than Gems so you get rewarded big time for having done that. I believe the last two levels require 
3,000 and 5,000 books of the covenant, respectively, which are very, very expensive, um, but that will max out your rally capacity, which is a nice benefit, and it is crucial that you do get to Academy 25. There's one other thing you should be thinking about with regard to these books of the covenant, and we'll cover this a bit more in the VIP portion of this guide. However, there are VIP levels that are going to have books of the covenant, including VIP 13, VIP 14, and you're just going to want to be mindful of when you're gemming books of the covenant versus getting them from VIP if VIP is something that you are spending on. With all of that said, your core objective in your city in the 5 to 30 million power range and beyond is to have all of your queues going 24-7. That's right, I want you training troops around the clock. Before you go to bed, you train your troops. When you wake up in the morning, you train more troops until they're high enough that you have T4 troops and these are high enough level that you can train enough troops that you need to only check in on that maybe once a day. My recommendation is you always have research going and you always have at least one building being built at a time. And the exception to that will be after City Hall 25, you're going to find you're going to have a hard time pulling in the resources to keep those buildings going at all times. Of course, one other currency you need to be spending down constantly is your action points with the intention of saving up your action point potions for special moments that reward you extra for doing things that you wanted to be doing anyways. Now, one of the most common questions as you're powering up is should you be upgrading your lower tiers of troops or training new ones? This is an important topic and it ties into an important idea, which is you always want to make your city look unattractive to hit. If you have lots of resources and you have lots of low tier troops, you look like a really good city to hit because people are going to get a lot of points for Mighty Governor. They're going to steal a lot of resources and you don't want to look like that juicy target. But the reality is as you're working your way past 10, 15, 20 million power, you're always going to have way more resources than your storehouse will be able to hold securely for you. So in order to make yourself look like a less attractive target, upgrade your troops instead of training new. That's right, upgrade all of your lower tier troops to the highest tier. The only exception might be siege units because the lower tiers move faster and some people prefer that. But I like to upgrade everything from whatever tier it is to T4. That way you don't have a bunch of troops and run the risk also of overflowing your hospital. This is a really phenomenal building that is very expensive to upgrade. The capacity of it will double in Kingdom versus Kingdom, which is good. But if your city is going to get hit, you're really going to be thankful for every resource you spent on keeping this these four hospitals you have in a really good place. Now, I guess one thing I should have mentioned on the topic of gathering when we were in the commanders portion is that by this time, all of your gathering commanders should be at level 37. That way they're getting the sort of max benefit of these gathering talents. You can take them a little bit higher to get some march speed, which I think is not bad. I don't have the experience tomes for that. But if you're being really good about battling the Holy Sight Guardians on the map, maybe you will. But there is one other very important solution to gaining lots of resources for your main account, and that is something called a farm account, which is our next topic. Okay, we just switched over to our farm account, and we're going to give you a high-level overview of things you should be thinking about with your farm account so that you can set one up quickly and start using it. The thing about a farm account that you're taking advantage of is the fact that it really doesn't take very long to send out your gatherers. You already were logged into the game. It only took you a couple minutes to send out some gatherers and get some resources on your main account. Well, what if you spent five minutes every time you did that, sending out the gatherers on your farm account too. Heck, it probably takes you two minutes, a whole heck of a lot less time. You also get all the resources being produced in your city, which if you're upgrading your resource production buildings, does add up as well. There's a couple different things that people think about when they create a farm account, and I want you to think about your intention here as well. The link will be in the description for the full farm account guide, uh, but when you're creating one, what you want to think about is the city hall level that you want to go to. 
Um, I've gone all the way up to City Hall 24, and I'm on my way to 25, because I use this farm account to send troops to die in war. I don't really care about these troops on my farm account, so this seems like a pretty good way to contribute to a war effort without losing troops that I care about more. With that said, the core consideration here should be the number of dispatch queues that you get. The more queues you have, the more troops you can send out to farm or more marches you can send out to farm at a time. So many people stop at just three or four troop dispatch queues. I would recommend you go to at least five because then your city is a good bit stronger. It's not quite as vulnerable. It's a side project, which is kind of fun to do. And the sooner you start one of these accounts, the you know faster you can get it up to a city hall level 21 or 22. Well, I guess it would be 17, City Hall 17 or 22. Uh, and since City Hall 22, it doesn't take that long to get to, but here's the thing. It's your farm account, so if you're not perfectly optimal with it, it's fine. You don't care. It's just there to generate resources for you anyways. So as you're building it up, you're going to need the resources on this account. The other reason I like getting to a higher City Hall level is that the way you'll get those resources from your farm to your main account is you're going to join the alliance that your main account is in or have your main account join a farm alliance with your farm. You're going to teleport them next to each other. And you're going to transfer those resources, and I'm tapping the wrong button here, there we go, uh, from the trading post, and I wanted the info button, there it is. When you do this, the higher level your trading post is, the lower the tax rate is. So I think the advantage of being a higher city hall level is not only can you make your city much more defensible, um, can you make it advantageous to have a lot of troops that you can dump into flags and all that sort of good stuff. Uh, but you also get a lower tax rate when you transfer those resources, which over time will add up. So I would encourage you to get to at least City Hall 22 for the five marches, and then you can also take your trading post to a higher level as well. Overall, you're not too concerned about your commander profile on a farm account. This farm account is 350 days old, so I started this 200 days after I started my main account. I really was late to get onto this plan, very late, and my account turned out fine, right? It turned out fine, um, but the most important investment in this account is going to be your gathering commanders, and your other commanders are really just there to get you to a point where you can level up your gathering commanders, right? Like you're going to need a Boudicca and a couple other peacekeepers to get those gathering commanders leveled up. The other thing I like to do is have a very, very high level wall, uh, a really primary commander on your wall. So I've got a, you know, level 60 Sun Tzu. And at this point, just from opening gold keys, I think that my Charles Martel, yes, yeah, 5511, you know, it's 350 days old. Counts really, really old. You get to a pretty good place. You too can have a Charles Martel, 350 day old account that looks like this with a pretty low effort. Okay. So that I think would be a solid recommendation to you for a farm account with the intention of generating those resources by going out on the map and from your production buildings in order to transfer them to your main account to deal with that absolutely crucial resource crunch in your grind to 30 million power. But then also for waging war, you'll definitely want tons of resources because you're going to need them to heal your T4 or your T5, but that's for a later guide. Let's go to our next topic, which is going to be research. Here we are still on the farm account, if you can believe it, and we've invested way more in research than most people do. Uh, the way that I see this is that over time, I'm just accumulating a ton of free speed ups as I'm leveling stuff up that I, you know, maybe one day I make this a main account. I take it to a young kingdom and have a lot of fun with that. But look, here's where you should be investing your research. And I want to highlight in the military technology something very important. As you make your way up toward the T4 troops, you're going to unlock these T4, hopefully before you hit 5 million power. But then as you're making way up, when you hit City Hall 23, you're going to have the opportunity to unlock all this good stuff over here and City Hall 24, all this good stuff over here uh, if you also level up your academy. And the thing that is so awesome about that is I call this tier 4.5. You gain so much combat effectiveness 
just from a very, very low amount of resources and time in these technologies over here. Um, how much do you gain? Uh, this is giving me currently at level six, I've got 7% which is pretty solid, that 7% attack, and I've got that for my infantry, my archers, my cavalry, siege units I'm less concerned about. Um, I also really like these technologies over here. Small amount of speed-ups initially gives you a huge amount of stat boots. For instance, combined arms. I mean, look at this. I could spend seven days and get 2% attack for every troop type I have. That's so much power gain for very little effort, especially when you compare to combat tactics, defensive formation, and herbal medicine, which these are things that, like, look, look, look at that, 50 days to work on this. I'm going to recommend that you work on these after 30 million power, okay? S once you hit that point where these become available, City Hall 23, boom, upgrade your academy to 23, and you start working on these. And as you're working your way to 30 million power, it is very important that you never go to sleep with research that's going to finish in the middle of the night. Like you should just speed that up and start something new. Because think about it. If you're going to go to bed at midnight, let's say, and you wake up at 8 a.m., but your research is going to finish at 4 a.m. Well, you've got four hours wasted there. So yeah, you're going to use, you know, four hours of speed ups or whatever to finish it early. But that's also like you've gained four hours of speed ups working towards your next research because that would have been dead time. So with all your buildings, with all your research, with all your troop training, make sure that you're using your speed ups in that way. Now, I also want to emphasize that many players focus on their military technology, but in a perfect world, I would encourage you to work on your engineering and mathematics, maxing those out as early as you can. It's going to take a huge amount of resources, but if you can do that early, you get a huge boost here. 15% uh, research speed is game-changing. In addition, the building speed, we don't have the max. If it was, you know, 35% at max, it's pretty game-changing. So I would encourage you to get those if you can before making some of your other major upgrades um, in your city, both for buildings and also, you know, get those upgrades as high as you can before you start doing some of these things like combat tactics and defensive formation, which are going to be really, really high numbers of days of research. This is the time when uh, you probably in your kingdom have captured the lost temple. And when you get to these things that are going to cost a lot of days of speed ups to work on, you want to make sure that you've got a rune from the map, optimally 15% from the lost temple, that you have a kingdom title to give you 10% extra research speed, and that you also have a kingdom buff potentially going offering you an additional 10% research speed. For these things that are costing you, you know, dozens upon dozens of days of speed ups in order to finish them, yeah, you're going to want to get those really high level before you start working on the expensive stuff. So don't make this mistake on your way to 30 million power, focusing on, you know, maxing out herbal medicine when you could gain way more power in other places in the academy. Let's jump to our next topic, which is going to be VIP. All right, let's talk about VIP. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the special privilege chest. I want to focus on the everyday value. The most common question I get about VIP is, should I use my gems? And there are some breakpoints here. At VIP level 10, you start getting a gold key and a legendary commander sculpture every day. Crucial. You also get some extra training speed and building speed. Very important. At VIP 12, you're getting another Legendary Commander Sculpture every single day, making it two a day, which is really, really solid. And at VIP 14, you're now getting three Legendary Commander Sculptures every single day. Now, most of you on your way to 30 million power are looking at this VIP 10 breakpoint. Should I spend gems or not? And that depends on how many VIP points you get a day from Alliance chests. If you're getting, like, less than a thousand and you're 50,000 VIP away, then that's going to take you 50 days. If you've got the gems, yeah, this is probably a good investment because every day that you have this, that you spent your gems on it, you get a gold key and 2,000 gems worth of value from the legendary commander sculptures. Plus you get the building speed and the training speed. Very, very solid. Those speed ups are worthwhile too. Um, if you're getting, you know, like let, let's be maybe a little extreme, 10,000 VIP a day, and your 50,000 
VIP away, then no, you know, take the five days of getting your amazing amounts of Alliance VIP from Chess, which I don't think he actually could get that much. That would just be insane. Like, I don't know, I maybe get 5,000 VIP a day in the Alliance that I'm in. If people are spending big, if it's a crazy spending day, maybe it's like 10,000, but you, you get the idea here. Now, in terms of commanders that come from VIP Chess, I do think that Hannibal Barca is not very compelling. If you're a big spender in the game and you get to a high VIP level early, then maxing out Hannibal Barca is a fine choice, and you'll get some value from that for sure. But most players should not even unlock Hannibal Barca. It's not worth it. The only thing I'll mention to you at those higher tiers is that you can get a lot of Books of the Covenant, and if you are a spender and you're going to be spending on you know, your gems into Books of the Covenant anyways— at VIP 13, there's 2,000 Books of the Covenant. And at VIP 14, there's another 2,000 Books of the Covenant. I think this VIP special privilege chest is really awkwardly designed because by the time most people would get this chest available to them, they've already maxed out their castle. So I think that if you're a big spender, consider these. Otherwise, just ignore Hannibal Barca entirely. Now, Minamoto, on the other hand, that's a different ball game. The chests here... It's expensive. You're spending 200 bucks plus on a legendary commander, but that is the cheapest legendary commander you can get in Rise of Kingdoms, and it is going to be one of the best barbarian hunting commanders that you can get in Rise of Kingdoms. I think he's very, very solid if you are a big spender. Again, prioritize your family and your financial future first before you spend like that in a mobile game. Even at 5511, a Minamoto can be very, very solid on the battlefield. And heck, even on my farm account, I decided to get Minamoto as a 5111 so that I could have more peacekeepers to run around with on the battlefield. Although this was like the pre Ethelflaed days. This is like crazy town, right? But you get the idea. I think that having Minamoto can be pretty solid. And I think that generally the VIP special privilege chefs are pretty decent, but we've got a full video that covers this. Link in the description for both Hannibal Barca and also for Minamoto from VIP. Let's jump to the topic that I'm sure you're really eager to get into, which is preparing for your first Kingdom versus Kingdom. Ah, Kingdom versus Kingdom. This game mode is insane. This is where eight kingdoms go head to head, battling it out, and your first one. There's no in-game structures for alliances to be formed. All of that happens in separate channels, probably in Discord. And speaking of which, if your kingdom is on its way into KVK and doesn't have a Discord server for either your alliance or the kingdom, get that set up right away. Let's talk about Kingdom versus Kingdom, which basically takes all eight of these kingdoms, puts them on the outside of the map in different provinces, and much like how you battled your way toward the Lost Temple, uh, you do the same thing here toward the Great Ziggurat in Kingsland. It's the same idea all over again, but with super high power accounts and kingdoms that are battling against each other. Now, look, the rewards for Kingdom versus Kingdom change based on the season, and there's a bunch of events here that we need to talk about. One of them is rebuilding your Crusader Fort. We'll get to that in a second. What I meant to show you is in the Crusader Achievements. Within the Crusader Achievements for the Alliance Rewards, there is a chase reward from KVK that people are going to be hunting for. In this case, uh, we're in Season 2 of KVK, and it's Wu Zetian. That is a really good chase reward. In Season 1 of Kingdom vs. Kingdom, that reward is going to be Charlemagne. And I've got good and bad news for you. Charlemagne is a commander that you probably don't care about. They're good for rallying cities, and that's all I'd use them for right now. So if you win your first KVK or you don't, it's not that big of a deal. Not like the second KVK, where the commander is absolutely critical. Um, so... I would not worry too much about whether or not your kingdom wins KVK. I would focus on learning the mechanics here and getting really, really good at building a kingdom that is good at waging war and knowing what your role is in that. So a couple things that will help you on your journey here. First and foremost, even just leading up to kingdom versus kingdom, there's something called the Eve of the Crusade. The first stage of that is a great event to spend boatloads of action points and get a ton of value. I would highly recommend it. Once you're in the 
Lost Kingdom, which is the special zone where KVK happens, uh, you're going to start accumulating honor. That honor will show up in the honor roll. I'm sure my honor is miserable. It is. I'm ranked 3,610 because I've barely done anything. This is my restart. And my main account is in KVK right now. I don't have time for this. Uh, but there are rewards for individual contributions. If they are very you know extreme, you can get a special city skin. There are rewards for alliance level contributions and being a top alliance. There are rewards for how your kingdom does for overall honor. My general guidance to you would be that you will be accumulating this honor over time, and you will want to hit certain breakpoints for getting the rewards in the Crusader achievements. These are visible to you here in the individual contributions. And the primary way you're going to get honor in KVK, besides battling barbarians, is going to be battling over these structures over here once they load in. There it is. Um, the ancient ruins are going to give a ton of honor. Uh, Altars of Darkness give a ton of honor. They open up periodically. You're probably going to end up setting alarms. Uh, however, the important thing is that you actually win this zone uh, and can uh, safely farm in that area. Uh, hopefully, you'll be allied with some of your neighbors. And if not, as soon as these passes open for the next zone, you'll be waging war. How do you keep your city safe in Kingdom versus Kingdom? The key thing you need to do is stay on your alliance territory. When you're on your alliance territory in Kingdom versus Kingdom, you can't get rallied. But just be careful. Because if you teleport onto another alliance's territory within your kingdom, and you can do that in KVK, um, your city becomes rallyable, it becomes swarmable, and you make yourself very, very vulnerable. You can't use a targeted teleport in KVK to go just anywhere on the map. You can only go on your alliance territory, or you can use a random teleport. And, and I guess by alliance territory, I mean your kingdom's territory. You can teleport onto any alliance territory within your kingdom, but you're only safe on your own alliance's territory. Um, look, in your first KVK, I would just be very, very careful about how many troops you're sending to die. Um, you could very easily, when you don't know what you're doing, send your troops to die in situations that are fairly non-optimal and not even accomplishing all that much. So if you're new to this style of waging war, get accustomed to what's happening first. And the biggest piece of guidance I'll give you as you're reinforcing rallies and reinforcing structures without just completely overlapping with you know at least a dozen other videos we've made is that you should not reinforce a structure from far away. Now, why is that? If I reinforce a flag, let's say, or let's say this fort was getting rallied, okay, and I reinforce it from seven and a half minutes away, which would be the march time over here, that would be really bad because that means however many troops I'm sending are not in the structure and nobody else can join it if it was at the capacity of the structure, right? So this structure can hold, you know, two million troops, but if I'm the last... 200,000 troops in, um, even though there aren't troops in here, the enemy could be hitting it and no one else can get in. Does that make sense? Same is true with rallies. If you reinforce the rally from really far away, those troops are considered to be on their way to the rally, so no one else can join, but it also makes it so that your rally is at way lower performance than it would be until those troops actually get there. Once they get there, you'll be performing at that optimal max capacity. So don't actually reinforce until you're right next to it, like this player over here, if they were in our alliance, get to here, then reinforce the structure. That way you're not blocking other people from getting in. That is like the biggest mistake you can make. And you can really mess up how a fight is going. If you're reinforcing from some eternally far distance, you're blocking your alliance members from getting in there and having the maximum sort of number of troops in there at any moment in time to fight. My overall guidance for your first KVK, again, is to take it easy. The reward is honestly not all that amazing. Learn how stuff works. Get close to your alliance members. And this is why in our kingdom, and I would recommend you take a similar stance, we always try to prioritize the active, high-contributing players over the low-activity level, 
minor contributors, right? The top priority has to be your active players because it is the active players that get you tons of honor for your kingdom, for your alliance. It is the active players that get you um, victories because they're sending their troops to die. So you want to be participative and learn how all this stuff works when the stakes are low. Charlemagne, in my opinion, is not important. So that when you go into KVK Season 2, your kingdom is in a very, very solid place. Enjoy just tons of free value as you're playing in this game mode, including rebuilding the Crusader Fort, which will happen very, very early on when you get into the Lost Kingdom. Uh, you'll see that in your past glory. Right now, I can donate gold, which, like, I don't need any of that. And I get these supply chests, which I can convert into other value. Really solid. Uh, just make sure you don't miss the third stage of the past glory, which is going to let you trade in all your excess sculptures for commanders you've expertise or don't need, and turn those into universal legendaries and other goodies, including, I think there might be arrows of resistance. I don't know if there's books of the covenant. Now I don't remember. Ugh. All right, friends. Hopefully you've enjoyed this comprehensive guide, taking you from 5 to 30 million power, including some overview for your first kingdom versus kingdom. Are there any other topics that you wish we'd covered or things that needed to be in here that we didn't talk about? If so, let me know down below in the comments and in the description of this video, there are going to be dozens of links to playlists and individual videos that will help you out on your journey to 30 million power. I am so eager to hear how that goes. Consider dropping a like on this video if you found it at all helpful. That helps out the channel a ton, which I greatly appreciate. Consider subscribing for daily Rise of Kingdoms content that is just like this, helping you get value and smash your enemies. And until next time, my friends, you have fun smashing the kingdom.